So we get into the prophetical part as we come into chapter 2 of the book of Daniel. And yet, even before that, we made a point to, to make sure you understood that the first 30 or so verses of Daniel chapter 2 are not so much involved with what is the dream and what is the interpretation. That's the goal that the, the King Nebuchadnezzar wants to find out. But it, the, the concerns of those verses are who gave the dream and who can give the interpretation. Therefore, as, as the, the dream, the finally the dream is revealed and the interpretation is given, it will be acknowledged that it's the God of heaven that reveals these things. It's the God of Daniel who made these things known. It's the God of Israel who was able to tell what's going to be in the latter days. And so there'd be no question about who is God. So Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who has conquered Israel. Both the northern ten tribes were taken some time before him, and he conquered Assyria, who conquered them. But the southern two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, were conquered by Nebuchadnezzar. And in the first time that he went in and took control of that city, he took away some captives, and such were Daniel. Uh, it tells us in chapter 2 of Daniel, verse 1, it said, In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his, his sleep break from him. And so we realize that Daniel was just taken, chapter 1 of Daniel, Daniel was taken in the first year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, according to Jeremiah chapter 25. And if you remember what we studied from Daniel chapter 1, like down in verse 5 of chapter 1, when Daniel was taken captive, he went into training to be one of the Chaldeans, one of the uh, ones who were an expert in wisdom and in knowledge in, to be able to instruct and advise the king. And that training course took three years. And uh, at the end of three years, we realize he stood before the king and was found ten times better than all the rest. But Nebuchadnezzar has this dream in chapter 2, and he called before him, according to verse 2, he called the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, uh, and the Chaldeans to, to show unto him his dream. And he began to challenge these men because he didn't want any fooling around. This dream meant something to him, although he didn't know what it meant. And so, in order to test that he was going to get the true interpretation from these men, he asked them, you tell me what I dreamed first, and when you can do that, then I'll tell you, then you can tell me the interpretation and I'll believe you're right. And they said, no one ever asked these things of any, any magician or Chaldean, that only the gods who don't dwell in flesh know these things. And Nebuchadnezzar got mad at him and, and ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. Among those who would be executed would be Daniel. But I remind you that if in chapter 2, verse 1, this is the second year of Nebuchadnezzar, something that always bothered me is how come ne Daniel wasn't called before him in the first place? Daniel was never among the uh, magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, or the Chaldeans. And the reason why, he was still in school. This is the second year. I want you to realize that Daniel chapter 2 apparently takes place that in, in, in between verses 17 and 18 of chapter 1. Daniel's taken captive. He goes through a time of testing. But Daniel chapter 1 verse 17 says, And these four children, God gave, the, gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding and visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days, the end of the three years, they went and stood before the king. But this is only the second year into his, into his captivity in chapter 2. And so they never went to Daniel and asked him for the understanding of the dream. He's just a student. But verse 17 already tells us that in that training time, while Daniel was still in training, it was very obvious that God had given him and his friends knowledge and that Daniel had understanding in dream, visions and dreams. You know why? Because of chapter 2. Daniel is the one who finally can tell the king the answer to his dream. When Daniel was going to be killed with all the wise men of, of Babylon, he went and asked for a little bit of time that he might go, he and his friends, and pray and ask the Lord to reveal the secret of what the dream was that was given to the king. And he was given the time to do so. And when we come to verse 19 of Daniel chapter 2, it says, Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. So he had, he had insight into visions and dreams. God gave him a vision and showed him the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And God answered the prayer of Daniel and his friends. And he was the one who indeed could go and reveal secrets. And, you know, it's, it is obvious, isn't it? 
that those who claim to be in touch with the spirit world never even went and asked the spirit world for the answer. They just wanted to immediately give an interpretation if the king told them the dream. But Daniel believed in his God. He had faith. And he knew that his God could tell him if he wanted to what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed because he has, he is, his belief is in the true and living God, the creator of all things, the one who knows every man's heart. And God who, know, who knows the heart knew what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed and what was in Nebuchadnezzar's heart. And you'll see God revealing that to Daniel. That tells us God knows what's in our heart as we sit here this morning. Whether or not we came here to study God's word, to have something revealed to us that would strengthen our life for his glory, or whether we're just passing an hour time or we're here because someone expects us to be here and we're living, we're here for their expectation so that they won't be uh, uh, saddened by our absence. Well, God knows us, and we're going to see that in this chapter. He knows Nebuchadnezzar, and Daniel knows his God knows. He goes in faith and asks God to reveal it, And verse 19 says God revealed it in a night vision to Daniel. Notice at the end of verse 19 it says, Then Daniel blessed the the God of heaven. He blessed. He gave thanks. Daniel in verse 19 gives thanks. In verse 23 it says, I thank thee and praise thee, O God of of my fathers. So Daniel gives thanks. Soon as he gets the understanding, soon as the vision comes to him of what the dream was, his prayer was answered. He thanks the Lord. And then he gives some praise to God's glory in the preceding verses and goes back to giving thanks again to God for the answer that has been given to him. Verse 20 says, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. There is in verse 20 through 22, and you can count them yourself, a sevenfold declaration to the glory of God. And, you know, when Daniel throws these out, sometimes, you know, you read some beautiful phrases in, in the Bible, and it's like poetry. For instance, he says for, uh, he says, for wisdom and might are his. He changeth times and season. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. Beautiful poetic language. And sometimes you read through there and... You get caught up in the poetry that you don't stop and realize that there's a lot of meaning behind everything that Daniel said. Daniel's life is spared because he now has the interpretation to the dream. Not only will his life be spared, but but all the the, the wise men, so-called, in Babylon, their life is going to be spared because he's going to be able to go to the king. And he thanks God and then he blesses God. He, He gives praise to God and he says some special things that have meaning. For instance, notice it says... Blessed be the name of, our, of God forever and ever for, and here's the first reason, for wisdom and might are His. Stop and think of that for a moment. Wisdom and might. What a unique uh, comparison or what a unique uh, uh, combination to have both of these things. Wisdom, to know, to have understanding, wisdom and might. You know, we'd be happy just getting one of those, wouldn't we? You either have, you know, you go through school, and I'm not making fun of anybody, but it just seems to happen this way. You have the, uh, the brains. They call them geeks, I think, these days. <laughs> we call them nerds and different things. You have the people who were brains, but their physical body, they didn't have too much to do. They couldn't do much sports and all. Then you have the jocks, the guys who were in sports, but they were kind of dunces when it comes to the brains. They had the brawn and no brains, and the, the people that had the brains didn't have any muscle. And, you know, but God, what has he got? Wisdom and might are his. He's got it all. That, that, that's comforting. He changeth times and seasons. You know, I thank God that not everything continues as they are. I thank God things change. That tells me I can change. That tells me that things aren't always going to be bad when they're down. Things do change. God, Daniel blesses God and, and thanks him for that, that he changeth times and seasons you know probably within a hundred years time and I know if some don't like me prophesying but <laughs> I don't know when I know in a thousand years none of us will be here I know in a hundred years we mo- hardly any of us will be here the children will all be gone as well but probably before that the Lord will come but one way or the other we're all going to be sitting in heaven someday and this will be a thing of the past times change things change boy that gives you shivers to think about that don't it he removeth kings and he setteth up kings. Well, that 
that tells you he's in control. The kings of this world, the governors of this world, the governments of this world, the powers of this world, they think they're in control. They think they have the dominion over this earth. But Daniel says he removes kings and he sets up kings. God is above all them. And while they think and try to convince us they're in control, they're not. God is always in control. He giveth wisdom unto the wise. Well, why would the wise need wisdom? Don't you find that one strange? He giveth wisdom unto the wise. Well, you know, you know who's wise? It said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth. You know what the wise person is? He's not a person who's got all wisdom. He's a person who knows to go to God to get the wisdom. He's a person who knows to ask God. That's what Daniel's doing. Daniel was wise enough to go to the true God and ask for wisdom, and he giveth wisdom to the wise. It says, he giveth knowledge to them that know understanding. Now, why would you give knowledge to someone who knows understanding? They already have it. No, they know understanding. They know how to understand. You know what they do? You go to the scriptures to get understanding. You go to God and you ask wisdom, and then you go to the scriptures to get understanding. And those who know understanding, he gives knowledge. You know where to get your knowledge from? Then you can get knowledge. You go to the scriptures. You know, that's paralleled what Jesus Christ taught when he was talking in parables. And he says, to them that hath, it shall be given even more. And to them that hath not, it shall be taken away even what they have. And what he's talking about, he's talking about those who are seeking God, those who desire to know God's will, those who are believing what God said. Those people get even additional information. But those who don't have that desire to know God's will, that will not believe what God has to say, they're going to lose even the knowledge that they have. And so these things parallel that. The sixth thing that Daniel praises God for, it says, He revealeth the deep and secret things. Deep. You know, when you get down in the deep, it gets awful dark. There's something there, you just can't see it. It's dark. And God illuminates. His Word and His Holy Spirit in our life is able to illuminate, bring to light some things that we couldn't see. We, we know it's there, we just can't see it. And God's Word is able to illuminate and bring it to light the things that are in the deep. But he also reveals secret things. Those are things that takes revelation of God to reveal. That's what Daniel's doing here. Daniel's asking God for some insight. What did this king dream and what does it mean? And God reveals the deep and secret things. It's revelation given to Daniel. That Daniel is going to prophesy what's going to happen in the latter days. And God's word does that. It illuminates and reveals it says, He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. He is over there in the light, the Shekinah glory of God, but the Bible says God knows what's in the darkness. You know, there's the prince of the darkness of this world who's working in this world a plan and a scheme that he's trying to overthrow God, but this verse tells us God knows what's in the darkness while he dwelleth in the light. In other words, Satan's devised plan of how to overthrow God and become the God of this world, God knows what Satan's going to do before he does it. And he's over there in the light. There's no darkness with God. And, you know, that's what this is about because he's about to tell Daniel what's going to be happening in the, in the satanic governmental systems of this world and what Satan is going to try to do all the way to the end time and then how God is going to destroy it all. Not only does God know, he's going to tell it to Daniel so that we know even what the, the prince of darkness is going to try to do in this world. These are the things that Daniel received as he received the revelation of this dream and he blesses God for these, these things that God need, is deserving our, our praise and worship for. And so he says again in, in Thanksgiving, verse 23, I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who hath given me wisdom and might. God who is wisdom and might gave it to Daniel. And hath made known unto me how that how uh, what we desired of thee, for thou hast made thou hast uh, made known unto us the king's matter. Now Daniel is about now to go to the king, but he's not going to when he when we find Daniel going to the king with the understanding here, you're not going to find Daniel immediately saying, "King, I got the answer. Here's your dream, and here's the interpretation." There's some things that Daniel do that to me look very risky for someone his young his in his predicament as a slave, but even in his youth, to go before the king and say. But it's very important for Daniel, for Daniel to teach Nebuchadnezzar what we said this first part of this chapter is about. 
and that is who is given, who has a dream, and who it is that's going to reveal the secret of the interpretation of the dream. That's important for Daniel to get across to Nebuchadnezzar. And so as he comes, here's how it, he approaches it. Verse 24. Therefore Daniel went in unto Arioch, uh, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. And he went in and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said... Uh, thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. I just like someone in politics, isn't it? Trying to take some credit for something he had no... He, his job is just go out there and kill the different wise men, including Daniel. Daniel comes with the interpretation, tells him I got the interpretation, give me, a, give me an opening to go before the king. So Ariok comes before the king and he says, I found a man, as if he's been out there searching, looking, and trying to take the credit. Remember, the king offered great reward to those who can interpret. And he might not be able to give the interpretation, but he thought, boy, if I put it this way, I'm going to get in line for a little bit of that reward. And you just see how things operate in government and before men, especially a man as prestigious and as powerful as Nebuchadnezzar and, and how people act around him. No different then than they are today, are they? Men are men. Verse 26, The king answered and said unto Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, uh, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? And Daniel answered in his presence, in the presence of the king, and what he's about to say, I want to say just this way first, when the king asked the question, are you able to give me the dream and the interpretation? Daniel, in, in essence, says no. In essence, he says no. Because what he's going to do is declare he doesn't have the power to give the answer He's going to give him the dream and the interpretation. But he's going to make sure God gets all recognition for it. And that's what he's about to do here. Verse 27, it says, Daniel answered in the presence of the king. Now you stop and think of those words. The presence of the most powerful man in the world, king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel, a young man, 15 years old possibly, answers before the king and says, The secret which the king commanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians... The soothsayers show unto the king. Ooh, <laughs> you ask a king a question? You were brought before a king, would you put him on the spot? You realize what Daniel's doing, don't you? He's making it very evident that he is much different than all these other people that he has in the king's court. He's not a magician. He's not an astrologer. He's not a soothsayer. He's in the, none of these occultic things. Daniel is making sure that the king understands that Daniel is different than all those men because he represents a different God. And Daniel goes out of the way and puts his life on the line to make sure that king recognizes that he's different than all the rest. And he makes the king acknowledge the fact that those guys and their gods couldn't do what Daniel and his gods about to do. You know, that kind of reminds me of something that's just natural for me. When I talk to people, I'm always emphasizing the fact that I'm a non-religious person. And I do that for the fact of keeping myself separate from all the people who, as the Bible say, name the name of Christ. I'm different than that. I, I'm not a denomination. I don't belong to a denomination. I'm not into labels and all of that. I'm a Bible believer. And I want people to know that. And there's ways of doing that is when you talk to them and what do you think? And you just simply say, well, it doesn't matter what I think. The Bible says this. Then they say, well, what's this answer? What do you think the answer to this is? Well, I don't think anything. The Bible says this. Be a Bible person. But make sure you, you separate yourselves. You know, it's so... Sometimes, you know, when you're in the world and among a lot of unsaved, you just kind of want to get conglomerated with the rest of the group. Uh, and just, uh, yeah, you're a religious person or you're a Protestant or something like that. Separate from all that. Make sure you acknowledge the people, no, I'm, not, I'm no denomination whatsoever. In fact, I'm not even religious. I'm a Bible believer. I think it'd be healthy. Daniel was doing that. It says in verse 28, it says, But there is a God in heaven. Now remember what he just said, that the, the wise men, the astrologers, the magician, the soothsayers, they can't show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known unto the, unto the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and thy vision of thy head upon thy bed are these. And Daniel's about to now give him the understanding. But notice how he says who it is that's going to give the understanding. 
But there is a God in heaven that reveals, not me, Nebuchadnezzar. I'm not about to reveal the secret. In fact, look at it, look as it goes on in verse 29. For as for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What shall come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known unto thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. But for their sakes that shall make known unto, un, known the interpretation to the king, and they, that they mightest know the thoughts, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. King, it's not for me, it's not for my glory, not for my wisdom. It's for the sake of the lives of all the people you're going to kill. And it's to make you know what your thoughts were. It's for you, Nebuchadnezzar, that I'm saying this. And it's God who's going to reveal all this to you, Nebuchadnezzar. It's coming right from him. It's not from me, it's from him. So that you know. Notice it says in verse 29, it says, And for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. You know, Daniel's not only going to give the, the man what he dreamed and what the interpretation was, he tells Nebuchadnezzar what you were thinking about before you fell asleep. Showing that the God who reveals the secrets knows what Nebuchadnezzar's thinking about. And Nebuchadnezzar lays down and he's, he's thinking in his mind as he's falling asleep that night, what's going to happen after this? You know, he's just raised to the, the highest power that a man has ever had in this earth. He's, he's got a dominion that covers the earth. And he's king of it all. And he's wondering, what's next? And God's going to reveal what's next. That's what the dream is going to tell us, is what's going to be in the latter days. But it's interesting that Daniel first tells Nebuchadnezzar what he was thinking about. Now, we're going to save the dream for next week. And we can go through the dream and start working on the interpretation and get quite a ways through it, if not all the way through it, next week. But there's something else we need to point out here. If you look back in verse 28, it says... But there is a God in heaven. Now Daniel keeps repeating this for some reason. Come over to look at verse uh, 18 of chapter 2. It says that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret. Daniel and his friends, they go and they ask the God of heaven for the answer. Verse 19. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Then you come over to verse 28, and he makes Nebuchadnezzar know the God of heaven revealed the secret. It keeps saying the God of heaven, the God of heaven, the God of heaven. And there's a reason for that that you need to know that's right in line with what this whole dream is about and what the interpretation is about. There's a reason why God is being called the God of heaven. And we're going to spend, we're going to look at a lot of verses and we're going to see why. And, and so it makes more, it makes the, the dream, uh, you understand more of the purpose of the dream. Uh, come back with me to, to Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. So God who created all things, heaven and earth, He's the God of heaven and earth. He's not just the God of heaven. He created the earth. He's the God of heaven and earth. And you're going to see the phrase, the God of heaven and earth, as we go through some verses. In, in, Daniel, or excuse me, in Genesis chapter 12, God called out Abraham. And he made Abraham a promise, a covenant, that through him and through his seed, through a nation that's going to be developed from the seed of Abraham, which is where the nation of Israel comes from, it says, through thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And there's some concern for the earth. And God raised up Abraham to bring blessing to the rest of this earth. Through a seed, Jesus Christ, but through the multiplied seed, the nation of Israel. That God is going to bless the nations of the earth. He's the God of heaven and earth. And he's going to bless the earth through Abraham and his seed, the nation of Israel. When you come over to chapter 14, it's interesting here that, that Abraham has just come back from defeating, among other things, an ancient king of Babylon, a king of Shinar, Shinar among about four or five other kings who had come from the east and came over to the west to the, toward the land of Canaan and there began to try to conquer the land of Canaan and took many kings 
And among those that they took, one of the last couple cities was Sodom and Gomorrah, who a nephew, Lot, happened to be in that city, should have never been in there, but was there. And he took Lot, they took Lot captive and they started heading back toward Babylon. Well, Abraham, who was taking care of his nephew ever since his brother died, goes after him. Abraham is so powerful, he has within his servants an army. And what the other kings of the, of the, of the West could not do, Abraham was able to do. He went and conquered those men and brought the, the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah freedom to come back and brought Lot back with him. As he's coming back, the uh, prince stops him. Verse 18. And it says, And Melchizedek, Genesis chapter 14, verse 18, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought, uh, brought forth bread and wine, and he, gave, uh, and he was priest of the Most High God. It is good to know that although it looks like the world had totally turned away from God when God called out Abraham, there were some Gentiles who knew God. Melchizedek. He is someone here that, that does know and is worshiping and represents the most high God. And he said, bless, uh, and, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. He realizes there's something special about Abraham. And he, when he mentions that, he says, Blessed is the most high God, the God of Abraham, the possessor of heaven and earth. He's not just the God of heaven. He's the God of heaven and earth. It's interesting that God called out Abraham because the men of this earth, the nations of this earth, had turned from him. And they began to worship stars. And they were going to worship the heavens, but not the God of heaven, not the most high God, but they were going to worship the planets and the angelic beings, the gods of the heaven. And they made images here on earth to those gods. Uh, if we had read one more verse... In, in Daniel, Daniel, Daniel's dream that he's about to interpret, he says, Nebuchadnezzar, in your dreams you beheld an image. And that's been the problem of Gentiles ever since uh, Genesis chapter 11. They, they were beholding images. Their eyes were on images rather than on the invisible God in faith who ruled all things. And when they, the, those nations turned away, God raised up one man and he was going to bless all the nations of the earth through that one man, Abraham. And it's God's relationship with Abraham that uh, Melchizedek calls Abraham, uh, Abraham's God, the possessor of heaven and earth. He makes Abraham swear, apparently here, that of all the goods that he's bringing back from Sodom and Gomorrah, that he would not take anything in reward for the things he's bringing back. For this reason, verse 22 and Abraham, he's offered, he's offered uh, reward. And Abraham said unto the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand to the Lord, uh, unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread even to a shoe latch, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich. Now, the one who's going to be known to make Abraham rich is the God of heaven, the most high God. He wouldn't take anything from a Gentile king because it's the Gentiles who are going to get blessed through Abraham, not Abraham blessed by a Gentile. And so this is what's going on, and that expression begins here, that God's dealing with Abraham causes God to be identified as the God of heaven and earth. But we don't see that in Daniel, do we? In Daniel, he's always the God of heaven. They always leave the earth part off. Well, let me continue to show you why. Come over to Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10. The nation of Israel had failed in the first generation that came out of Egypt to do the things and to walk in faith that God told them to take the land of Canaan and they wouldn't do it. Their children are going to take it and God reminds them of who they are as a special people unto Himself. Deuteronomy chapter 10. I'll start reading in verse 12. It says, now Israel, And now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to walk uh, but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's, thy God, the earth also, with all that therein is. God is not just the God of heaven. 
He don't just possess the heaven of heavens and everything that's in there, but the earth belongs to God. Everything that's in the earth belongs to God. And who is he? He's the God of Israel. That's what this is bringing out. He's your God, Israel. Verse 15, Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them. And he chose their seed after them, even you above all people, as it is this day. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskins of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. Israel, follow me. I'm the God who possesses everything in heaven and everything in earth, and you're my people over this earth. And Israel failed to be the kind of people that God wanted them to be. But as he's dealing with them, he calls himself as the possessor of heaven and earth. Come over with me to uh, Joshua. Try to hit these real fast. Joshua, that's the book after Deuteronomy, chapter 2. It's interesting to hear what Rahab, who lived in Jericho, she's a Gentile, but heard of Israel was coming and that they were going to come and conquer the city of Jericho because that was the way they were going to start taking over the land of Canaan, the promised land that God gave to, to Abraham, uh, Isaac, and Jacob, to the, to the seed of Israel, the seed of Jacob. And when she hears that they're coming, she makes a statement in verse 2. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you, for the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. And you know what they know? Is these people in Jericho know that God gave the land that they're in unto His people, the nation of Israel. And they're scared to death. They've heard of how he conquered Egypt. They heard what he did to the, to the, to the, uh, to the nations that were on, on the other side of Jordan. And as now they're crossing into Jordan, these people are scared to death because God, who owns the heavens, also owns the earth and gave their land to Israel. They're scared. Joshua, they go in in chapter 3. Look at chapter 3, verse 11. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passes over before you into Jordan. The ark is going before him. God's representation is going before Israel, but he's called of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passes before you. Israel, don't worry as you go into that land. You're following the Lord of all the earth. It belongs to him. And he's going to reign over it all. He's God of heaven and earth. And Israel, as you go into that land, you're going to establish a kingdom here on earth, the kingdom of God on earth, the kingdom of heaven. So Israel goes in to possess that land. Come over to 1 Chronicles, chapter 29. David is ready to retire and put Solomon on the throne. He's finished conquering all the land from, and, and putting down all the enemies of Israel. 1 Chronicles, chapter 29. 1 Chronicles 29, verse 10. Now look what David says. Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, uh, our, our Father, for, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord. Thou art exalted as head above all. You know, when you talk about the kingdom of God, you better understand it's obvious. The kingdom of God is heaven and earth. The kingdom that God is going to establish on this earth is going to be through the nation of Israel. And through Israel, God's earthly people, He's going to be possessor of heaven and earth, majesty of heaven and earth, ruler of heaven and earth. That's what the nation of Israel was called to establish a kingdom here on earth that Jesus Christ will reign as God over all the earth, heaven and earth. And so they're acknowledging his possession of both as David has this reign and has brought rest to the land. But, you know, he passes it on to to Solomon. And that's when we studied previously. We saw that from Solomon on, the kingdom went downhill. Until when you come to the end of Chronicles, the kingdom has been given over to the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. Come over to Second Chronicles chapter 36 where we had our scripture reading. And don't give up on me yet. The blessing comes as you get to the end. <laughs> Second, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 36, the last king of Judah who sat on David's throne is Zedekiah. This is the third king. This is, this is the 
Nebuchadnezzar had already come in twice. Daniel's already gone, taken away. Daniel's vision that we're studying in chapter 2 has already taken place by the time verse 11 takes place. Dan, and, and Zedekiah was put on the throne by Nebuchadnezzar because he swore allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar. Watch the verses. Verse 11. It says, Zedekiah was, was one and twenty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned eleven years in Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, his God, and humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him to swear by God, but he, he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart from turning, uh, from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. He not only turned from God, but he broke his oath with Nebuchadnezzar. His oath with Nebuchadnezzar is that he would rule under Nebuchadnezzar this land. Then he decided he was going to take it back and be king of the land without Nebuchadnezzar. So he rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 14 says, Moreover, the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after the abomination of the heathen and polluted the the house of the Lord, which he had hollowed in Jerusalem. The place where God made himself known in Jerusalem, the temple. They even profaned that. Offered sacrifices to idols in the temple. And so they're, they're really in rebellion against God. And as a result of that, you read down through the chapter, God brings Nebuchadnezzar over and Nebuchadnezzar conquers them for the third and final time. Destroys the city, burns the city. And the third deportation takes. The city of Jerusalem is destroyed because of what Zedekiah did. But you know, the writer of Second Chronicles gives us history beyond Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar came in and wiped out the people of God that were to be the people that brings God's reign upon the earth. So all of a sudden the reign is now in the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. And there's going to be some people after him that's going to have that same power. Verse 22 says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the media Persia empire conquered the Babylonian empire years after Nebuchadnezzar. It says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord, spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah, might be accomplished. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, and he made a proclamation throughout all the kingdoms and put it in writing, saying... Now listen to what the king of Persia said. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, All the nations of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given to me. Did you catch that phrase? You know why he's called the Lord God of heaven? is because Israel's no longer in their land. And God's no longer in the temple in Israel, dwelling with the people on the earth. God is in the heavens. And He's taken all the kingdoms of the earth. He first gave it to the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Then He got conquered by the Medes and the Persians. And Cyrus recognizes that all the kingdoms of this earth are in my hands, a Gentile king. It's not in the hands of Israel. It's not in the hands of God. He's given it over to the hands of Gentiles. And therefore, God begins. the phrase begins to be used, He's the Lord God of heaven, but He's not the Lord God of heaven and earth because Israel's not in their land. And Israel's not ruling their own land, let alone Israel becoming the nation through which God is going to rule the earth. And when He makes that statement, it's, He goes on to say, And He charged me to build Him a house in Jerusalem. It's going to change again. In Judah, who is there among all His people? Where's that nation of Israel at? The Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. Let him go. Let all the Jews that are in our land go up to Jerusalem. We would say go back to Jerusalem so that they could be the people of God. Because only when Israel is in the land is the Bible called God the possessor of heaven and earth. The God of heaven and the earth. Without the nation of Israel ruling in their land, he's retreated to the heavens as the God of heaven, but not the God of heaven and earth. Not the God of the earth. Because the earth has been given into Gentile hands. How long? Well, come over with me to Zechariah. No, not Zechariah. Ezekiel. Where we were reading last week. Ezekiel chapter 21. And remember Nebuchadnezzar came to the parting of the ways when he came up against Zedekiah to destroy the city. You remember that last week? Say yes. Or yawn, whatever you want to do. (laughs) This is, this is the fulfillment of what we were reading over there. Zedekiah had rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar came. He's either going to go uh, destroy the Ammonites or he can go destroy Jerusalem. And God worked it out that he would go destroy Jerusalem. Because what he did, it says in verse 23, And it shall be unto them as a, a false divination in, in their sight to them that the sword uh, that hath sworn the oaths. See, they don't believe that Nebuchadnezzar is going to come and destroy Jerusalem because they think Nebuchadnezzar is fooled by their false oath. 
They made a promise. Oh, we swore allegiance to you. And they don't think Nebuchadnezzar is going to come in and conquer them. But he knows about it. God put it in his mind, so he's going to go conquer. Verse 24. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because ye have made your, because ye have made your iniquities to be remembered, and that your transgressions are discovered, so that all your, your doings, your sin do appear. Because I say that ye are come to remembrance, ye shall be taken with the hand. And thou profane, wicked prince of Israel, whose day is come when iniquity shall have an end, thus saith the Lord God, remove the diadem. Remove the crown from Israel. I'm taking away their kingdom. Remove the diadem. Take off the crown. This is not, uh, this shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. And it shall be no more until he come whose right it is and I will give it to him. Take the crown away from Judah. Take the reigning, a reign away from Israel until he comes who has the right to reign. Take it away because Israel's become wicked. I will overturn, overturn, overturn. Three deportations took place, did it not? Under Daniel, then under Ezekiel, and then finally uh, Jeremiah stood to the end when the city was destroyed and saw it all. Three deportations take place. You read the book of Ezekiel, 